Father, we ask that your Holy Spirit, who does indwell his word, would quicken this word to our hearts and create faith in our heart as we hear the word of God this morning. And that he would create in us this anticipation that the early church had, this longing that we should have as your people, as we look and as we wait for Jesus to return, that we'll have expectation in our heart that he's coming again, that he's coming soon, that he's coming quickly. And may our life be ready, may our lamp be always burning, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, here in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 7, John gets right into, I think, the heart of Revelation. He sue with introductions and benedictions and doxologies. And before you know it, you're just kind of hit. Behold, here he comes. You haven't even gotten into what's going on in the book yet, you know. And John is hitting us right away. This is, this is what the book is going to be about, you see. It's all headed toward this great climax as we get to chapter 19. The world is just like a, a, going through a turmoil and going through a struggle and bubbling and boiling with anger and wrath against God and God's anger and wrath against this world. And then finally chapter 19 and Jesus comes back. And John's way ahead of the story. In Revelation 1-7, he's already talking about Jesus' return at the end of the tribulation period. So I would say here in this verse, verse 7, he jumps right into the heart of Revelation. The Lord is coming back to the earth. Everyone will witness it, and the world will be very sorry for it. This verse combines those three things, that Jesus is coming back, everyone will see it, and everyone will be very sorry for it. What John has done is he's taken Daniel 7.13 with Zechariah 12.10 with Matthew 24.30. All of these are already being written previously. And he has woven them together to form this composite that we call the seventh verse of the first chapter of the book of Revelation. Daniel 7:13, Zechariah 12:10, and Matthew 24:30. <clears throat> now, with a couple of these, the meaning has changed a little bit, and it has to become obvious to you as you study biblical prophecy and biblical eschatology. But John is certainly dependent upon earlier prophetic writing and speaking in Daniel and Zechariah, the writings of the prophets, and Matthew. Something, no doubt, that John the Apostle heard Jesus himself say toward the end of Jesus' earthly life and ministry as they have beheld and asked him to behold and to comment upon the beauty of the stones with which the temple and the temple mount is adorned in Jerusalem. And Jesus, of course, launches into this dreadful, fateful, dark exposition of what the end of the world holds for the nation of Israel and for the Gentile population in general. And it's not a very pretty picture. It is a dark and a foreboding picture. Beginning with, take heed that no man deceive you, because many deceivers are going to come. And again, it takes us right through what we're going to also be studying here in Revelation, only to end with, and then finally, after, immediately so, the tribulation of those days shall the sign of the Son of Man appear in heaven, and he'll be coming with great with the clouds, with great power and glory. Jesus does the same thing that we find here in Revelation. Revelation is patterned right along the same line as the eschatological teaching that Jesus gave in this foreboding 24th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew. I don't know how far we're going to get into verse 7. It's really got those three parts I just said. He's coming, everyone's going to witness it, and everyone's going to be sorry because of it. Look at the verse. Can't you see those three parts to it? Behold, he cometh with clouds. Every eye shall see him, they also which pierced him. That's parenthetical, the last part of that. Every eye will see him. Well, if every eye, then obviously those eyes of those who pierced him. So he's just saying the world will be a witness to the second advent of Jesus Christ. And the third thing he says, and everyone will be sorry because of it. You know, whenever you mourn and cry, 
you're experiencing some sorrow and some dread. Now, it won't be the godly sorrow that produces repentance. It'll be that horrible terror knowing that it's time now to meet the Maker. Now, if I haven't already said, I think I did this morning already. If you didn't catch it or if you don't already know, this is a post-tribulation verse here. This isn't the return of Jesus to catch the church up before the tribulation. There he comes to the clouds, remember, and stops and catches the overcomers up to himself. For he said that where I am, there may ye be also. That's John 14, 1 to 3. Here he's not coming to the clouds. He's coming accompanied with the clouds. He's coming with the clouds. It's a different preposition in Greek. He's coming with the clouds. So make sure, make no mistake about the matter that this, um, this is not a comforting verse in, in the sense of the rapture of the church. That's a comforting passage. Paul said, comfort one another with these words. 1 Thessalonians 4, around verse 17, verse 18. Comfort one another with these words. Well, this isn't a comforting verse. Oh, of course, you could take it that way. You as a believer are, are comforted over the fact that eventually Lord's going to come and he's going to set things in order. So you take comfort in that. There's no question about it. But this, this, is, a, this, is, a, this is a foreboding, dreadful passage here. That look, he's coming. Everyone's going to see him. And everyone, all the tribes, literally, all the kindreds, all the tribes of the earth will mourn, will cry out because of him. Now, we'll see many passages that say that very thing. He has taken something from Zechariah 12.10 and applied it a little differently because Zechariah says whenever he returns, all Israel will mourn because of him. That's true. But they're mourning in a sense of repentance. And here John has taken a verse and he's brought it over to the New Testament, although he's not denying Zechariah 12.10's original meaning, he's changed the meaning of it now. And he's applying it to another group of people, not to Jews, but to the whole world. And not to sorrow, godly sorrow, 2 Corinthians 7, that leads to repentance, but this is that worldly sorrow of, of feeling sorry for yourself that you got caught and knowing there's nothing you can do about it and knowing that there's nothing in your heart that even makes you want to repent. That's another type of sorrow there. It's that I feel sorry for myself. It's not sorrow over sinning against the Lord and coming short of his glory. That's the type of sorrow that produces repentance in a person's life. It's good to sorrow in that way. Blessed are those that mourn, for they shall be comforted. These people are mourning. They're not going to be comforted, though. It's a different type of mourning. Paul said that there's worldly sorrow. And what does he say that it does? Well, turn over there to 2 Corinthians 7. What does Paul say that worldly carnal remorse and sorrowing does? Turn over to 2 Corinthians 7 and verse 10. Where here Paul says, For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation not to be repented of. In other words, it's something, your sorrow is something that you don't have to be sorry about. You've got to repent over something, but then you don't have to repent over the fact that you had to repent. It's good to be sorry over your sins so that you repent, and then you never have to be sorry that you had to be sorry for your sins because it was the first sorrow, which was a godly sorrow, that led to repentance, to salvation, not to be repented of. But... The sorrow of this world worketh death. You ever found anybody, ever read about, heard about, or were you that way in your past life? Were you in inner periods of great sorrow, and all it did is it produced death? It, there was no change. You felt sorry for yourself. You felt like you were slipping into a bottomless abyss, and there was nothing you could do about it. It didn't, it didn't produce godliness in your life. It didn't produce conviction or repentance in your life and how many people have gone down to their grave i'm talking about suicides now because of the great sorrow they had my life didn't turn out the way or is not in the process of working itself out as i wanted it to and people become very sorrow over that sorry over that and it just one one tear produces another produces another and people get possessed by demons in a state like that Jesus said, you're blessed if you mourn, but you've got to be mourning for the right reason, in the right direction. 
My wife was talking with a friend from another state yesterday on the phone, and they were telling us some things that I didn't know, but I was just shocked to find out. I was standing there in the same room as she was talking, and she gasped, and then I want to know, what are you gasping about? I don't get to hear, and so she tells me, and I gasp. But we knew a family some time ago, pastor and his wife, in this walk had a number of little small blessed children that were under them, and there was just something that was not right there. The parents were forcing things on their little small children. The parents were, they had emotional problems uh, seriously themselves and would try to put off their responsibilities on their children and make the, I don't know, it was a bondage type thing. They kept their children out of school and schooled them at home, but it was like, it's because this, this world is so big and bad and fearful and we're, we're afraid, we're afraid. And those type of ideas communicate things, you see, to children. The kingdom of God is not a place of fear. It's of righteousness and peace and joy. Say, we don't go to school and we're laughing over the whole matter. But it was like they, oh no, this, this world is out to get us and they're so afraid, you know. I, I've talked before about what bondage and legalism will do, not only to adults, but what it does to children. And inevitably, children will grow up and rebel against it. They have to be raised with the truth, which does contain many stipulations, but in a spirit of joy and victory. And they don't rebel against that. What they rebel against is whenever they can tell their parents are insecure and their parents have just legislated certain things to them. And maybe the things are right. You don't watch television. You don't go to school, all this. But it's in a bondage type mentality. And, and the child resents that. And it starts really early, you see, in life. They resent it so much that they grow up then to throw that off of them and they rebel against the religion of their parents, which was a biblical religion, which was Christianity. And I remember a little girl, I knew her when she was three, when she was three, and when she was four, and when she was five, and when she was six, a precious little darling of a blonde that was in church all the time. Her father was a pastor. Her mother was a member in the body, raised in it, born at home, raised in it, never gone to school. So she's got to be about 13, 14, 15, 16, somewhere in there, and not long ago, she tried to commit suicide. 14-year-old girl, a little blonde darling whenever I knew her, like my little darling Jennifer that I have. Can you imagine growing up, she turns 15 and tries to commit suicide? You've got to be in one mess in your life. To be that young, you haven't even, you haven't even hit the difficult part of life yet when you get to be an adult. What does adulthood hold for you when you're that young? And I don't want anything to do with my parents and that. She was raised, bab baptized in the Spirit, I thought. Maybe so. I don't know. Early. Saved early. Baptized in water early. Prophesied early. Sang songs to Jesus and about him. But there's something about bondage and legalism that strangles a person. And so what I'm saying about her is, well, yeah, I'm sure she feels really sorry. I feel sorry for her. I'm so sure she has felt sorry for herself. But what does worldly sorrow work? Death death it just works death because you see here's what you go through in your mind you know you, you think that you're up against a wall that you're in a trap and there's no way you can get out of it and you see it's a delusion it's a work of the devil to convince the person that god's not on your side he will not help you he cannot help you your only hope is to try to do something for yourself and so what someone tries to do is they try to kill themselves that's the type of sorrow that's going to be here at the end of revelation 1 7 all the earth is going to mourn. They're going to mourn and shriek and wail. But it's as the condemned criminal who is taken off to the stocks is wailing and shrieking and mourning. It won't be in repentance and it won't be in joy. You know, you can cry and be happy. Some of us can be strange. You can cry when you're sad or cry when you're happy. They won't be happy. They will be sad. But they won't be sad because they've somehow short, shortchanged God. God gave them life and breath and all good things, filling their hearts with food and gladness, and what do they give him? Nothing but blasphemy and resentment and bitterness and hatred. They're not going to be sorry that they've shortchanged God. <clears throat> what they're going to be sorry about is now it's too late to do anything about it. It's time, as Amos said, Amos 4, I think, it's time to meet their maker. And it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Well, 
I may be getting too far in the verse. I need to backtrack here and pick up with the, where John starts here. Behold, he cometh with clouds. I want to teach on this aspect of it this morning. And if I think of other things to say about the rest of the verse, I'll either say it this morning or we'll make some other messages out of it. Behold, he cometh with clouds. Now, I'm going to take a guess here. My guess is that that, that phrase, behold, he cometh with clouds, and that initial word, behold, is kind of a blah word to a lot of people. Uh, and the sharpness and the excitement of the word, the initial word, behold, and the whole phrase, behold, he cometh, accompanied with clouds, escapes us. But what do you do whenever you behold a flower? What does behold? Behold seems to be kind of like a stiff King James word. We don't use it a whole lot today, so it's just become a kind of a stiff word that's blah to a lot of people. What, is, what, what do you mean when you say behold a flower? Don't you mean to look and to see? That's what this word means. It doesn't mean behold, like, well, how do you behold? Behold is just a word to a lot of people. It's just a blah word. It's just a blah idea or concept that doesn't have any meaning. It's not pregnant with any vitality or excitement. What the word means is look or see. It's like John waves at us. If you could look up here at me, he's waving at us. This is a look term. And he says, now follow my finger. Look, he's coming with the clouds. It's an, excite, an exciting statement there. He's wanting to get our attention. He says, look. Well, we can look up. We don't see it. John can look up there. There wasn't anybody coming with clouds. But it was so certain and so soon in John's mind that he could say, look, he's coming with the clouds. You see, that's what John is trying to communicate. I think that a lot of people don't take it that way. It's just behold, he cometh. Like behold is like a once upon a time type phrase. Well, sooner or later, once upon a time, he'll come. And behold doesn't mean behold. Behold means look. Well, look where? Well, if he's coming with the clouds, that would mean look up. Well, we can look up. We don't see him. Well, he's not here yet, but it's so soon and it's so certain that it's as though he's there right now. And John says, look, he is coming. Cometh, let's just make it the way it is. Here he comes with the clouds. It's not, well, he cometh sometime in the future. It's he's coming now. Look. He's coming now with the clouds. This is a great climax that this earth is rushing toward. It's somewhat comforting to us, and it's faithful for this world. This is not a pre-tribulation verse, a pre-tribulation coming of the Lord, which really carries with it only comfort and joy because it only concerns one group of people, and that's us. This concerns a whole mass of people, all the people on the earth. It concerns them, and it is the climax to which this earth is rushing. Time isn't just merrily going along. Time is rushing toward its culmination and conclusion. That's the way, that's the way John wants us to see. That's the way the Holy Spirit wants us to see verse 7a. Look, Jesus is coming. John said that 2,000 years ago. It was so soon to him. He died and never saw it happen. It was so certain. In other words, the look expresses not only the nearness, but the certainty of it all. When you can say, look, he cometh, and no one's coming at all, you must be pretty certain about matters. Or either you're having problems in your mind, one or the other. He's counting things that are not as though they were. Because he has faith and he knows, he's certain. Faith is certainty. He knows it's going to happen. So it's as certain as what we can see around us as we look and see clouds that are empty. They do not have the Lord's presence. He is not coming with them. John says, I know it. It's soon, it's certain. Look, Jesus is coming. And he's coming with the clouds as his entourage. This is an awesome statement that he's making. Look, he cometh with the clouds. This is an awesome statement that John is making. This is our hope, our expectation. I know we will have already been raptured, but it's still our hope that there's going to come an end to evil in the world. Because us being caught up in a rapture, that's not the final. That's just something preliminary. We're still in an intermediary state, an intermediate state as we exist 
with the Lord waiting for the tribulation period to come to an end. That's not the end. That's just an intermediate state there. That's why I can still say that this is our hope. This is our expectation. This verse, although he's not talking to or about us, he cometh with clouds. If you read the rest of Revelation, we would find, and so are a lot of other people. He cometh and they cometh with him, and they're all coming with the clouds. Read Revelation 19. He comes on a white horse, and all the armies in heaven follow him upon white horses. If he's coming with clouds, they're coming with clouds as well. He's not really talking to us here. He's talking to this world. But you see, the world isn't meant to, isn't expected to read the Bible. So he's not talking. He's talking to us. It's with reference to the world. So it gives us some type of incentive in this life and in this world. Every eye is going to see him. You know, he didn't get to judge all of his enemies whenever he was on the earth. People accused him of this and finally spitefully mocked and crucified him. And his prayer, his prayer was, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That won't be his prayer when he comes back the second time. He said, Father, forgive them. And the Father has been in the process of providing a way of forgiveness for 2,000 years now. And he has been tolerant and long-suffering with the world. When Jesus comes back, he won't say, Oh, Father, forgive the world. He will smite the nations with the rod of his mouth. He will do that whenever he returns to this earth again. Now, you see, although it is to the world, in a sense it is, and it's to us because it gives us some incentive in this world to line our lives up with holiness and with what God wants us to be and do. Because there's just something about it whenever you know, whenever you know that you're on the winning side, even though your side hasn't won yet. There's something about knowing that you're on the winning side, that you're on. Every now and then in a, some sporting event, you can kind of know because the other people are so outmanned, you know that you're on the winning side. And you just kind of, it just makes the game that much more enjoyable because there's no stress like, well, are we going to win, lose, cliffhanger? This isn't a cliffhanger. It's nothing like it. It's, it's over with as far as he's concerned. 2,000 years ago, he said, here he's coming. I see him. Look. And you look up there. He's telling us, look. Whoever reads Revelation, look. He's coming with the clouds. Now, there's going to be somebody alive on the earth that actually sees that happen. And John says they are going to mourn, wail because of him whenever they see him come. So that couldn't be talking about the elect. Couldn't be talking about us. Because this is an ungodly, a worldly type sorrow that they're going to be crying and moaning and shrieking and wailing about. It's something comforting to know that we are, that we now are on the winning side. So this is something that we as believers should often talk about and think about and pray about. It's the model prayer, thy kingdom come. That's the coming of the millennial kingdom of Christ at the end of the tribulation period. It's something that we should often talk about and think about and pray about and teach about and sing about. Amen. And sing about. A lot of our songs are about the return of Jesus. A lot of our songs are about that. They should be. It's something that... 2,000 years ago was so certain for John, he said, look, look up now. I'm on the island of Patmos. I'm looking up. Look, I can see him. He couldn't really. It was by the eye of faith. But there will come a day when you won't have to have the eye of faith. It'll be literal, bodily, visible. Physically, he will descend from the clouds to the earth. Look, John said, Jesus is coming again. I remember a song that I heard this would have to go way back in my early Christian experience. I learned it off of contemporary, uh, some contemporary Christian radio station. So it wasn't like a church hymn or a little charismatic ditty. It was what contemporary Christian music can often sound like. And the, the beat wasn't bad at all. The beat was totally scriptural. And I remember learning a song about the return of Jesus. And down through the years, I never could remember. I knew the chorus, and I couldn't remember all the verses. It had too many verses to it. One I did remember said something about, um, I can't wait to check into my mansion and get my sleeping bags unrolled. Well, I didn't ever really like that verse too much. Because <laughs> I was afraid that, yeah, that's contemporary Christian music. It comes out of the counterculture contemporary movement. Can't wait to check into my mansion. You know, like you check into a holiday and get my sleeping bags unrolled. 
I'm not carrying any sleeping bags with me. <laughs> going to be something better. I'm not staying. <laughs> you know, Holiday Inn advertises this is a place of, of no surprises. Well, heaven's going to be a place of a whole lot of surprises, but you're not going to be surprised by fleas and by sleeping bags, though. That's for sure. I don't know that we're going to sleep. So. <laughs> but I, I understand the meaning. But it came from someone that was influenced by that background, and you're just into the backpack and beard and long hair and guitar and traveling around the country carrying a knapsack and a sleeping bag on your back. I can't wait to check into my mansion and get my sleeping bags and roll. Well, I remember whenever I moved into my study over here, it's been two or three or four years ago, the, in the, while in the process of moving over here, I lived in another place, and I had to drive back and forth bringing Day after day, it took me a few weeks, just whenever I came over here, then I brought a lot of my books and things over here. And it was in the process of driving back and forth, I got a new song. I got a new song. It was this old song. I still knew, I remembered the music from it, but I got all new verses to it. I've been singing it ever since then for about three years. And it talks about the return of the Lord. And we know a lot of other songs here in our body that talk about Jesus is coming back. Jesus is coming back. You can't ever get away from that. Jesus, it gives meaning, it gives purpose to the believer's life now. Jesus is coming back. And how much more those of us who are living now when we are with the understanding that we have. We're not living in the 12th century A.D. or the 6th century A.D. or the 18th century. We're living now. Israel is back home again. There's a mighty nation in the north of her that could one day try to come down and crush her. The great bear from the north even uses that as one of her symbols. And she certainly is a bear. We've seen all these things happen. Signs of the times are all around us. They're being fulfilled. How much more should that to us today give us purpose and meaning to our life? But you've got to keep it uppermost in your mind. He is coming again. He is coming again. Homes, cars, all possessions will be burned up. All earthly relationships will be severed i mean you won't have earthly relationships anymore if you have any there'll be heavenly ones then all pursuits and goals will all be will all be 100 percent holy and pure and godly and heavenly because that's where we'll be is above or when above comes down when heaven comes down to earth in the millennia you know i think one of the strongest things as jesus taught us in the parable of the sower in matthew chapter 13 that the believer has to struggle against is living in this present world during which time that seed is being sown in his heart because what is around all types of cares and deceitfulness of worldly endeavors and they choke the word out if you could say that this is probably the greatest struggle and the biggest problem is simply this and that's the christian while the seed is being sown in his heart doesn't get to go to heaven and have that happen he has to have that happen right in the here and the now Remember what we've been saying in Sheep and Shepherds that God is after a big, difficult final goal. The only way to reach a difficult goal is through difficult means. He's going to prove and test and refine and purify us through the trials, as Peter said. He said, count them more precious than gold that perishes because whenever Jesus comes back, he'll be found to his praise and honor and glory. It's always continue in the faith because you're going to have to enter into the kingdom through much trial and tribulation. You prove yourself now, not by running away from your problems, by stomping on them and overcoming them, by getting the victory over them. The hardest thing is that you're expected to be holy and different and pure. That word, that seed is being sown in your heart. But we all say, well, I wish I were in heaven where I could be learning the word because it'd be a lot easier to practice it there. That's the whole point. Obviously, it'd be a lot easier. But that didn't prove anything about you. I told somebody here that I was having to talk to on the phone the other day, and they said, well, you don't think I'm submissive, and I say that I am. I said, well, I said, here's the problem. I said, submission is a name for nothing until the heat is turned up in the kitchen. And if you're submissive then, well, then we know you're submissive. Submissiveness, it can't be proven until there's a trial that proves it. So just by being quiet or being sweet or being whatever, that doesn't prove anything. Anybody, a lost person can do that. It's whenever the spotlight is on you, can you maintain your faith now? Whenever that heat is turned up seven times hotter as it was for Daniel's three friends, can you maintain your faith now? Well, that's, where, that's where, what it's all about right there, friends. That's the whole biblical message of faith and of trial and of difficulty. 
It's easy to be doing okay when things are going okay. But that doesn't prove anything about us. What proves something about us is when we are tempted to believe, to do, to think, to act another way. Uh Uh-oh, now the pressure is on us. Now we've got to make a choice. And we say, my, there's nothing wrong with saying this is difficult. God never said it wouldn't be difficult. He, He did say it is possible, though. Just say, this is difficult. God, give me the grace because I'm going your way. People can get real super funny, super weird, and think that, well, type of message I thought I was hearing from faith and so forth about the Bible is that life is just, you're not supposed to say you've got any problems and nothing's ever difficult and just, you're just smooth sailing through life. Well, that's not what Paul said. Paul said you must do much tribulation enter the kingdom. What God is looking for is our heart. He doesn't mind you saying, Father, this is really difficult. He just wants to hear the end of it, though. Jesus, I remember, said one time, I don't want to go to the cross. But that wasn't the end of his statement. Then he said, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. All the first statement is just a confession of your human nature, of your humanness, of your earthliness, of reality. This is hard. I don't want to have to submit, or I don't want to have to lead, or I don't want to, whatever it is you have trouble with in your life. I don't want, it's difficult. No one said that it would be anything but difficult. I never said it would be. I never, I never promised you a rose garden. I never told you that this life, you won't have any problems at all. I've told you just the opposite, but I've said, be of good cheer because Jesus has overcome the world. In the world, you'll have much tribulation, but be happy. He's overcome it. We're in him. If he's overcome, we've overcome. We've overcome by the fact that he's overcome and we're in him. We overcome by what he's done, by the blood of the lamb and by staying with him, by the word of our testimony, the word of our mouth. The Bible is full of promises that this life will be difficult, that there are trials and temptations in this life. And I guess you could have it presented in such a way that you're supposed to never think, you know, just, well, there's nothing wrong with saying, I don't want to go to the cross as long as you don't stop with that. I don't want to have to give this up. But I know I have to, so Father, help me. Please help me. He's just looking for you. Are you willing to cry out and say, help me here? I don't want to have to change. If you want to know what I want to do, I would rather be rebellious against you. I don't want to have to do this. It's not comfortable. It's not pleasing. If you want to hear what I think about the whole matter, I don't know that that's the way we should talk to God, but on the other hand, he can read every thought of your mind and heart anyway. Just as long as you end with saying, and all these attitudes I'm expressing, they're all wrong. They won't get me anywhere but hell. So just help me. Help me want to do your will. Guess what? He'll help you. He wants you to do his will more than you want to do his will. And he wants you to want to do his will more than you want to do his will. I don't ever get on to someone if someone comes to me and they tell me I'm having a problem here as long as it don't end with that. I, I, generally, they're there because they want some help. So I say, well, that's you're here. That's a good sign. The Bible didn't say we would never have any problems. The Bible says that the Bible wants to introduce us to the great problem solver. We have our problems and difficulties. And it's no praiseworthy thing to try to pretend like you're something that you're not and be super whatever that you're not. <laughs> Say, I'm never tempted, don't ever have any temptations at all. And I just thoroughly enjoy everything. I've never run into a difficulty in my life. Number one, that's just not true for any human that I've ever met. It may be more true of some than others because some have overcome more than others. But the only way it becomes more true of some than others is over the path of victory. They have overcome things and now it truly becomes a delight. I don't think Jesus is struggling on the cross. He did his struggling in the garden. He's not still on the cross saying, I don't want to go through this. He's, he struggled once before in the garden. And he said, what did he say? He said, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Can I paraphrase that and say it like this? I don't want to go through this. I do not want to go through the cross experience. If it's possible, let this cup pass. But he didn't stop there. He said, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Not what I will, but what you will. God always will come through and sustain us and give us grace to help in time of need. 
Jesus was strengthened by an angelic presence there, we read in one of the gospel accounts. He was under such agony that he sweat, as it were, great drops of blood. He didn't sweat blood. It said, as it were. That's a figure of speech. As it were. The Bible talks about, you know, such, such, such and such as it were a great mountain that fell into the sea. Well, mountains don't fall out of heaven into the sea. It's as it were. There's something similar to it. Well, what happens whenever you bleed? Whenever, what happens whenever you perspire? You just perspire. Blood, it's just drip, drip, drip. It flows out. That's how he was perspiring. Perspiring in the garden. He sweat, the Bible said, as it were. You know what sweat is? That's perspiration. Remember, Jesus was fully a man. He sweat under agony as it were great drops of blood. He didn't sweat blood, but his sweat was like blood running out of him. It was so profuse. And what happened? An angel came down from heaven and strengthened him. God's going to strengthen us by his angelic ministers Hebrews 1.14, they are called to minister on our behalf. He'll send an angel. He'll send his own presence, his Holy Spirit, his anointing. He'll send a word to you. He'll give you a vision or give you a dream or a prophecy or a word of knowledge to someone else, give you a teaching, give you some fellowship with a brother or sister that will strengthen you. But only if we'll do it the way Jesus did. Go ahead and say whatever you want to say that I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to because he knows your heart anyway as long as you say, but... It, it doesn't matter what I don't want to. This world isn't governed by my will. It's governed by yours. And you told me that if I wanted to be your disciple, I was going to have to pick up my cross daily and follow you. So that's what matters. What matters is what you will, not what I will. Jesus got to that place, victory. They hit him in the face, blindfolded him and said, you're a prophet? Tell us which one. Was it I or was it he? Who was it that hit you? Well, he didn't want to play those games. They're going to treat him as a pseudo-prophet here. You know, mock the gift of the word of knowledge and prophecy and all. Mock all of that. Mock his supernatural abilities here. Why, he could not only have picked which one it was, he could have read off to them their birth date and everything else, everybody in the whole city of Jerusalem, had he willed to. But he did not will to play those games. His mind was made up. That'd be a temptation. You know, they're mocking you, the Son of God, now to go back or... Rethink your decision again. Now, let's rethink this cross matter here. He never rethought it again. I'm going to the cross. He knew that he was going to the cross from early on in his life. But, you know, there's something about knowing it and something about its um, impending approach that makes you get serious about making your mind up finally and once and for all. Whenever it's just around the corner, like the next day, that he makes his mind up that night. I'm going. I'm going. And he has to come. He's the one going to be persecuted and killed. And the three disciples he brought along for a little extra aid and comfort. They're no aid and comfort. God had to send an angel down. They're all drowsy, sleepy heads. They're all asleep over there. And Jesus has to go back and wake them up. And then whenever the high priest and all of them come out to try to capture him, which they do, then he has to strengthen the disciples, the apostles. They're so afraid of what's going on. And they finally just took off and ran. Can you believe Peter did it? And James and, well, the rest of them, they just tucked their tails and ran in his hour of greatest need. Well, that was all in the will of God. It was prophesied in the Old Testament. I will smite the shepherd and the sheep will flee. Zechariah 13. But it's in the will of God so that Jesus is living out as a man his whole and holy high calling and has set an example for us. And he had no one to depend upon but the Father. And he talked about a dark hour coming. He said, now is your hour and the power of darkness. He said, all have left me, but my father has not left me alone. My father is with me. That's around the end of John chapter 16. So that's where we have to be in this all. So back to Revelation chapter 1 and verse 7. I guess I got off on that by telling you about we ought to talk about and think about and teach about and sing about. Behold, Jesus is coming. Look, here he comes. Let's look at some passages real quickly here, and then I want to get into another aspect of the study. 1 Corinthians chapter 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 22. I, it's not news to you. I'm not telling you something new, that the New Testament documents are replete with teaching, references, allusions to the second advent. 
Paul here writes, 1 Corinthians 16, 22, If any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, then let him be anathema maranatha. You say, well, where's the second advent here? It's in the last word, the second foreign term, maranatha. A couple of Aramaic terms, anathema, let him be accursed, maranatha, whenever the Lord comes. It seemed like those had become particular words, so particular for them that Paul probably put in a Greek letter Aramaic spelling and word. So it's just transliterated from Aramaic right over into English so that we know there was something significant about anathema maranatha so that Paul doesn't translate it as let him be a curse when the Lord comes or so that someone else hasn't translated it, let him be a curse whenever the Lord comes. If any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, then let him be a curse at the second advent. You could paraphrase it like that. And is that not what Revelation 1, 7 says? Whenever he comes, all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. If you don't love the Lord Jesus, if you don't love him, then what happens is you'll be judged for your lack of love at the second advent. Second Timothy chapter 4 and verse 8. This takes it a step further, I believe. If you don't love the Lord... You'll be accursed at the second advent. Well, how about if you don't love the second advent? You don't love the Lord's appearing whenever he comes again. Well, this more particularly is talking about the fact that we need to think and sing and teach and talk often about the Lord's return. 2 Timothy 4, 8. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. That term appearing in the Greek is a particular term that refers to the second advent. That love his appearing. Because there's going to be a day of judgment. There's going to be a day of judgment. And right next door, Jude, verse 14. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of thee, saying, and here we go with our term, look! And this was Enoch who said it. You think John thought it was certain. Well, John lived several thousand years closer to it than Enoch did. Look, the Lord is coming with ten thousands of his saints, and then look at the context here, to execute judgment. Now, that happens to be probably one of the best passages in all of the Bible, Jude 14 and 15, to tie right into the theme of Revelation 1-7, that this is not a pre-tribulation, rather a post-tribulation verse. Jesus is coming back at the end of the tribulation to the earth to judge the earth. And what did Enoch say? He said, look, here comes the Lord with ten thousands of his saints. And why is he coming? Well, read all of verse 15. To execute judgment upon all. And he just goes on and on in this verse. To convince all that are ungodly. Notice it's always in reference to the sinners. Among them of their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which sinners have spoken against him. Hmm. Which ungodly sinners have hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. You know what hard speeches are, these blasphemous words and ideas that people have and say about Jesus? Hard speeches. He's going to break those hard speeches with something harder than the speeches. And let's go on then in verse 7 to the next thing that John tells us. Not only look, he's coming, but look, he comes with a unique either atmospheric or heavenly entourage. He cometh with clouds. Now, we know he's coming with his saints. Jude just said ten thousands of them he'll be coming with. And other portions of the New Testament and the Old tell us he'll return with his angels and with his saints. But John doesn't mention that here. 
I find that interesting. John doesn't mention here, he's going to mention on another occasion that whenever the Lord comes, he's coming with his saints. He's coming with the holy ones, which would include believers as well as angels. You could find passages that would support the fact that both will be with him whenever he returns. But John doesn't say that here. Here is the entourage he refers to. He cometh with clouds. He cometh with clouds. Why is Jesus returning to the earth in a company of clouds? Have you ever thought about that? Why is he returning to the earth in the company of clouds? I want to give you this morning two reasons the Bible sets forth why when Jesus returns, it'll be with a cloudy entourage. I find this to be very significant. This verse has always stood out in my mind as being... And then whenever I have the privilege of studying it and teaching it, it even more registers upon me. But before that, I just knew this verse, there's, there's something about it, exciting about it. Look, he's coming with the clouds. I mean, I think that verse has always stood out to me, let's say, more than verse 8, right? It probably has to you if you've read very much this chapter in Revelation. I'm awful, mega, big, beginning, ending, which is and was and is to come the Almighty. Well, that's a wonderful verse, but there was something about seven, though, that was just like, wow. Look, he's coming with clouds. Every eye will see him. Parenthetically, those also that pierced him and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. I'm going to give you two reasons the Bible sets forth why Jesus, whenever he comes, returns with a cloudy entourage. First of all, the Bible will say that it identifies him to the world as a divine being. It identifies him to the world as a divine being. See, he could come without the clouds, right? But he's coming, he's chosen to return with clouds. It identifies him to the world as a divine being. I mean, who but God could command the clouds as his heavenly retinue? 